So the epicenter of sort of orthodox faith is a place called Mount Athos. Mm -hmm. You should totally go because women aren't allowed, right? Really? It, yeah, it drives me mental. You should go. It's, it's called Mount Athos and there are hundreds of monks and priests that live there and they're completely self-sufficient and you can only access it by boat. If you Google it, like it's quite remarkable. And anyway, they obviously, this is their diet and there's a lot to be said about the diet of the Mount Athos monks. So I, was e I basically just emailed all of the churches there. I'm like, guys, right, I'm Greek, this is what I'm writing about, who's going to help me? I think I said this to you, at the, I said this at the book launch, but it was really funny, there was this one priest, this one monk I was trying to chat to, and I, at the time, I had a very tiny newborn baby and this toddler, and my time was all over the place, and I was trying to pin him down, and I was like, right, can you do this day, these times, because I know I've got help, any of these work for you? My, this is like Tuesday, nine o'clock, Thursday, ten o'clock, he was like, by the grace of God, we will speak. I was like, babes, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you there. However, <laughs> we, ne we never spoke on the phone, put it that way. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Well, I, I wanted to find out a bit more about you before we get on to your incredible book. Nist Am I pronouncing right? Nistissima. Yeah, perfect. Nails it. Great. Nailed it. <laughs> I nailed Perfect. it. Nailed it. <laughs> um, tell tell me about how you got into food because, like, I mean, your your family is obviously very food orientated. Did you grow up in North London? Is that yeah, is that what you, yeah, yeah, yeah? I grew up in North London. So um, my grandparents were still alive. They had a restaurant in Tuttle Park. Mm -hmm. um so at the time in the sort of 60s and 70s all greek cypriots and turkish cypriots they would they sort of lived around camden and that part of london real community and both sides of my family had food businesses so my mum's parents had a deli mm. and they used to import um all cypriot produce and you know back then in the sort of 60s and 70s if you wanted olive oil you'd have to go to a chemist you couldn't get really? it in a supermarket yeah so that bubble, that granddad, my mum's parents, they imported olive oil and olives and halloumi, feta, all that kind of stuff, which, you know, you can get everywhere now, but back then you couldn't. And then my dad's parents had a restaurant for just under 30 years. My mum's parents were older, so they retired just when I was born. So I don't remember the deli, um, but the restaurant, my dad's parents are younger. So that, that was, I was around for like, they didn't retire till I was a teenager. So it was a really big part of our life. Like our life revolved around the restaurant. Like every Christmas, Easter, Saturday, Sunday, we were always there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they lived upstairs. My parents used to live upstairs. And yeah, it was just like our life, you know, I joke that my life is like my big fat Greek wedding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it really is. Like I'd married an English guy. My family had a restaurant. I was forced to go to Greek school. Like it's, I watch that film when I have slight PTSD. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> From the ethnic side, I get that so hard. But um, but yeah, it was amazing. And and you know, it's that is of, of course it's you know, that's why I'm. I guess I love food as much as I do. And the gra that granny, um, she lives down the road to me still, and you know, I still cook with her. That's amazing. amazing. Yeah, you can say that's amazing, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. That sort of cross generational household, yeah. I think, is like it's very common. I think uh, as as part of like an immigrant story, like as you're describing that, I'm thinking about my early childhood yeah. as well, and like our extended family who used to like own stores and live above it. Yeah. Like it's just so it's so typical. Like, <laughs> yes, totally. And I went to really. I grew up in a really sort of diverse part of London, so. Uh -huh. Um, you know, in, in a way that actually, if you were sort of white British, you're probably a minority, you know? Mm. So that sort of, what I say, multi-generational living and lifestyle was just really normal. Like people live with grandparents, there was an auntie somewhere, you know? And I, and I love that. And I love that they're still around. So I think it's, you know, it's a real privilege to be able to, you know, learn from elders as well. Like it's, it's amazing, you know? Yeah, yeah. My, it, it, it's, it's strange. I have a slight connection to North London. Well, my, my parents are now based there, but my okay. dad's business was in uh, North London. It's, he's okay. been there for like 30 years. Oh, amazing. And I always remember going past like this London Greek radio sign. Yeah. Yeah, the massive building, right? LGR. LGR. Yeah, yeah. yeah LGR, that's the one. <laughs> I've been on LGR, big fan. Uh, all Greek. Well, listen, grew up listening to LGR. I'm, I'm such a cliche. As a kid, I was like, LGR. Why do you have to listen to this? You know. Yeah. And now my, I'm like, 
your grandparents coming over we're listening to lgr my kids are like oh mom i just want to listen to harry styles <laughs> yeah it's so funny because my equivalent was um sunrise radio yes and it was it was, like, it was like the worst type of like uh it was like uh it wasn't even fm it was like am and it was all oh. crackly oh, and God. like yeah yeah Oh, it's so bad isn't it and the way it's all produced you're like there's just no fluidity on this situation but you can't change it it's the way it is yeah 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 totally I think one of my dad's first employees um was Greek and so okay. when I was like four or five I remember um I'd go into the store his name was Zakos I remember okay. him he was like the most Greek man ever he had like a mustache Tash, he yeah. always wear like an apron, a very strong accent. He'd always take me to the sweet store across the road Aww. and just like and buy me sweets and stuff. I remember going to, uh, he invited us around to his house and that yeah. everyone was there, the whole extended family. I can't remember exactly what we ate, but I remember it was a lot. A lot of food. Loads no. of food. It was incredible. Yeah, yeah. That so we are never, that is like, it's like a fear of like <laughs> there ever being not enough food. You know, it's yeah. a real thing. Like, I'm up so I'm up north at the moment at my in-laws house <clears throat> and they live in Lancashire and you know they're English and they're lovely and it's so funny like I helped my mother-in-law cook a meal on Monday because all the kids came over and uh, she would bought this piece of pork for the dinner and I just started panicking I was like it's, it's not enough meat Heather it's, it's just not enough meat you need another joint she's like what do you mean I'm like it's just not you need extra there needs that is just enough you know, the idea of there being just enough, like, makes you come out in a rash. I'm like, mm. but what if there's not, you know, people always want more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thing, like, Greeks just have to feed. I know it's definitely, like, there's, there are lots of cultures like that, but I definitely think it's true of the Cypriots, for sure. Like, you know, it's, like, common thing. The first thing I taught my husband in Greek was the word gani, which means gani. enough. Gani. Ah, okay, yeah. yeah, so, like, he would yeah. go to both my grandparents' houses, and I'd be like, you need to know gani because they just will keep feeding you. That was like his first <laughs> word. It was like, gani, gani, you know. Like, just learn that, you'll be fine. That's fair. Yeah. So when, when you were growing up uh, in London, would you would you go back home fairly Always. often as well? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We go back to Cyprus a lot. So um, <clears throat> my immediate family is here, but our entire extended family, like I've got way more relatives there than I do in, in England. Mm -hmm. um, so we go back, at, you know, probably at least once a year, um and I I you know I love that and I think then we've said even me and my husband have said there might be a time when we live there for a little bit mm. <clears throat> excuse me but yeah I love it and I just you know growing up it was just my granny dragging me around churches there was a lot of being dragged around churches but as I've got older like I've loved just exploring the island and getting mm. to understand like why we are the way we are a bit more you know um, but yeah, I, I love going back, you know, home or whatever and understanding, especially from a food point of view, because that's where as a kid, it's different. Right. But now as an adult, my world is food. Mm. So understanding things like I didn't know growing up that the village my mum's parents were from was famous for rose water. Oh, so wow. just like, you know, you get told stuff as a kid, but you don't care. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't care. But yeah, it's famous for rose water. Well, just stuff like that. Or like the village my yaya who's still around is from is famous for making halloumi like I mean everyone makes halloumi but it's particularly good mm. so it's just yeah really lovely understanding that sort of because I think food if you understand the food of a country you understand the culture a lot more and I think that's a really obvious but true thing to say for everywhere really isn't it yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I I always say that I mean even though like sort of my bias is towards healthy eating and you know talking about the the benefits of food and <laughs> The research behind the ingredients i think you, you never want to lose that sort of cultural element yeah. that heritage the celebrational aspects <clears throat> of of food it's so so important you know so it's you know how people say it feeds your soul it literally feeds your soul you know totally. it's, it's, it's part of your history and also for you i think it's really interesting what i've learned you know and i'm not medically trained at all but what i have learned over the last few years i think since having kids and just learning more about food is you know, so my, my last, my latest book is, is vegan, but it comes from a, um, a religious point of view. And what I've learned is, you know, people have asked me, are you vegan or why aren't you vegan? And what's really interesting is we are all built differently and you will understand that as a doctor more than anyone. And so what I've learned about myself and my daughter, one of my daughters, is that she has a blood disorder that is very typical from our part of the world. Mm. So she's got something called G6PD. Um, and I've always battled with anemia. So I was vegetarian for 10 years, but <clears throat> it didn't matter 
how many lentils I ate or how many supplements I took my I could just ne- I could just never could get my iron mm. to a level where I, I was healthy you know I felt okay and I you know as a, t- a teenager in, in my early 20s I was upset that I couldn't be vegetarian but I had to educate myself as to why even as a carnivore now when I'm pregnant I have to have iron drips just because my iron still crashes and it's that thing of understanding where you're from to know why you are built the way you are so when people say to me now sometimes in maybe an accusational way just some, sometimes that curiosity like why aren't you vegan I would I, I'm just really honest and I say look I'm I'm a I'm privileged to be a conscientious carnivore I eat everything I eat meat in moderation but I'm lucky that I know where I can get my where I can get my meat from but at the same time I have to I just I can't be healthy mm. like I just don't feel good and my eldest daughter we found out she has this blood condition and it's so interesting you know it, she can't eat broad beans how mm. random is that yeah. But it's because of where we're from. And I think you have to sort of understand a culture to understand why people eat maybe certain things or a certain way. And not every diet and lifestyle is OK for everyone. You know, Absolutely. Like if she was if she was to be vegan at some point in her life and she if she is and, and, and if she turns that way when she's a teen, you know, I'll help her. But, you know, she, she has to understand that she's going to have to eat because she always has anemia. And so it's just really interesting. And I think it's really important to understand your background to be as healthy as possible really yeah i mean that illustrates such a good point about personalized diets and how uniformity in terms of the advice that we give to people like Mm -hmm. okay everyone should be plant-based or everyone should be omnivorous or whatever you know it just it doesn't make any sense from a from a what we call p4 medicine so predictive personalized it's you know preventative yeah it's it when I think about the food from Indian culture, just yeah. looking at my heritage myself, you know, and you look at our the likelihood of certain genetic SNPs, so they're called single yeah. nucleotide polymorphisms, okay. that enables me to be able to extract the most out of things like lentils because okay, I yeah. can, you know, and, and certain types of uh, fats from nuts as well, like okay. the omega-3, our conversion is slightly different yeah. compared to my Caucasian counterparts yeah. who may not be able to extract the same amount from lentils and different nuts. They'll have to get it from things like wild fish. Yeah, you know, and so it's it's those minutia, the the, the slight differences yeah. that are very hard to tease out without looking at swaths of data. And I think w- yeah. what you're describing there is also being a bit more intuitive about how you feel yeah. and yeah. being led by you know what what's more appropriate for you, particularly at different yeah. stages of your life, like pregnancy, postpartum, yeah. postmenopause, all these different yes. areas. I mean, it was so different. It's so it's so true. And we're, we are, you know, and it was interesting writing that book because I lived and breathed it for a long time and I was eating the food I was cooking. So I was predominantly vegan, but I did end up quite anemic as a result of it. And it's, you know, the idea is that orthodox countries, because there's such strong faith when they're um, before the big festival. So before Easter, Christmas and there's one in August, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, they give up all animal products. So like Maya, yeah, who's who does it very strictly, very religiously, she um, she won't eat any, ma- anim- any animal products for 50 days before Easter, 50 days before Christmas and two weeks in August, every Wednesday throughout the year and every Friday. Wow. If you count up, it's like 200 days a year or more, you know, like the, there's Coptic Christians in Egypt that it's more. So anyway, but that's it's a really interesting way of living. When I first started writing the book, I just, I wanted to write a book which was celebrating vegan recipes from countries that just, they just eat that way, Mm. not making them vegan. But Mm. then as I got into it, I just thought, actually, this is really fascinating because people think of Greek food as very meat heavy. Yeah. You know, souvla, gyro, all these things that we know are sort of junky food. But actually, because of the way we eat religiously, if you go to Greece or Cyprus, you can easily eat vegetarian and vegan, very easily, in fact, mm. because they eat that way 200 days a year. It's the other 150 days a year where they eat meat. And that balance is also, it's interesting that now we're trying to replicate that by doing things like Veganuary yeah. or Meat Free Monday or, you know, so where maybe religion is less prevalent in our society, in the West, at least, we're now trying to replicate these practices of cultures and communities that are have been doing it for religious reasons so 
I come from it from a very unbiased viewpoint in terms of religion. I don't, there's no preaching at all. I don't, mm. it doesn't matter what you do, but it's just interesting, isn't it? Like, yeah. that's just the way, you know, she will eat lentils and pulses and vegetables for over half of the year. And then the other half of the year, she eats a bit of meat. And it's just, yeah. you know, it's fascinating. I just think it's really interesting. And like, yeah. You know, that- yeah. Yeah, that that balance that you find when you look at sort of traditions, yeah. it, it never fails to amaze me. And that's why, like, I always get all these I told you so's from my family, because yeah. it's like, well, I told you fermented <laughs> food was good for you. I told you that turmeric was great. You know, yeah, yeah. I, you know, exactly. I yeah, said yeah, that yeah. you should have your lentils and your rice and all these different uh, yeah. ingredients. So you get all your nutrients and you eat the rainbow and all that kind of stuff. And it's yeah. like, yeah, OK, yeah. I mean, like, you know, we're really standing on the shoulders of uh, tens of thousands yeah. of of uh, 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 years of just yeah. like tweaking, you yeah, know, totally, changing things totally. and being a lot more intuitive, yeah. you know? So, we're like, guys, we've discovered this thing. <laughs> we're so clever because we figured out if you eat this way or you eat these things, you'll feel really great. And our ancestors are like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you just discovered it, you know? But it, it, it's, yeah, it's so funny. Like, oh, the pennies just dropped. Yeah, you yeah. Eat, you eat a plant-based diet and you feel really good, but then occasionally you might eat a bit of meat. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. That, that could work, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. So, G- Georgia, tell tell me a bit about your experience in um in in kitchens when you were, when you're growing up you know with your family and and, yeah. and the food. what what was what was that I've got this image of you like you know being roped into the kitchen and roped into the you know the restaurant and you know yeah. uh, doing weekends and all that kind of stuff well we we were quite my our kitchen was like something out of like a comedy my gran and granddad <laughs> would be shouting at each other in Greek there was a lot of it was very fiery very tempestuous me and my sister were never really trusted with very much um, we were allowed to fill the salt and pepper shakers or put the p- paper tablecloths on the tables. My sister, there was a, I don't remember this. I think I must have been too little. But do you remember Shake and Vac? Do you remember that? Shake- stuff? Oh, yeah, I remember right, that. Shake and Vac. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. We were in the restaurant and there was the restaurant part of it must have been carpet. It, it was carpeted part of it. You'd never have that now, really. But no. I mean, you know what I mean? Like that's, you know, <laughs> so it was carpeted. And my sister was getting the salt shaker. She's older than me. She's four years older than me. And she's really cheeky. And she was going around the restaurant going, you do the shaken back with the salt. <laughs> anyway, my AR is quite a character. She's very fiery. She's brilliant. And she came out and she started shouting at Lulu going, I, what are you doing? Blah, there's salt all over the floor. And Pat, I think just because I was so used to being like, you know, her, her dog's body, I just apparently went, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> and my AR was just like, sorry what and my sister was sat there with a smile on her face and she's like I know you did it I know it so we weren't really trusted with very much we were always getting in the way but um it never to be rubbed off and then you know like just watching my uh, cook all the time and then as a teenager it was really funny I think because food was such a big part of our life and it was so ingrained I didn't really think that that's what I should do for a living I just thought mm. everyone was obsessed with food mm. so when you know you're at school and they're like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I was vaguely, I was, I was academic and I didn't go to a great school. I just went to a very standard sort of state comp and I was quite academic and they were like, you know, you should do more academic stuff, blah, blah, blah. I was like, yeah, yeah. They're like, you could do something creative, history of art, fine arts. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I used to have a farmer's market stall in North London, making cakes and breads and salads at the age of like 18. It's oh, still wow. in my mind, I should probably work with food. I was like, yeah, yeah, university. So it wasn't until I went to university that even after having farmer's market store in this family restaurant that I was at uni and all these girls around me were reading Grazia and Hello and all those, you know, OK or whatever. And I was just binge reading Delicious. <laughs> Delicious had just come to the UK and because it's Australian, right? And uh-huh. I it had just come to the UK and I was just sat there in my final year at uni and I was like, I should I should probably do something about this so I wrote to them I said can I come and do work experience they said yes you know nowadays it would be like a wait list I'm sure mm. and I and I went on my first photo shoot and I, I just had this real epiphany that I was like this is what I should be doing it's I've got this creative side to me but I love food and there are people that write recipes and cook them for photography and telly and that was it I was just like hook line sinker you know I, I was obsessed and I was like that's that's the career for me I just you know, I knew it. it took a while you know it clearly took a while for me to get there. But I think when something's so almost so obvious and such a big part of your life, maybe you don't see it. 
Mm. You know? Yeah. But yeah, food was so important to us, but I just thought it was the same for everyone. And it, I mean, you know, maybe it isn't. Maybe they're not as obsessed. They're sitting there reading magazines. I think, but I think people that listen to your podcast probably are the same as us. Yeah, no, there definitely are. I mean, I, we did a poll recently of um, uh, people's sort of culinary confidence in the kitchen and how okay. experimental they are. And they definitely lean more towards the sort of like foodie spectrum of like, okay, you yeah. know, uh, I, I want to uh, learn new things. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, probably a subscriber to a bunch of these magazines yeah. like Olive and Delicious and Bon Appetit and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So definitely that were with a sort of health slant yeah, uh, yeah, to it yeah. as well so yeah, yeah it's a yeah. little like I mean, healthy I love that. tribe it's so good that it's become so much more sort of commonplace back then so I started in the sort of food styling world when I was so it must be 17 years ago mm. you know and if I said to people back then you know I'm, I'm a food stylist I'm an assistant food stylist they would say you know what's that and I oh, I remember being single and going into bars you know you'd meet a guy and be chatting if I wasn't particularly interested, I would lie. I would say, oh, I'm a teacher or I'm a student because I couldn't be bothered to have to explain <laughs> what a food style I was like. Oh, gosh, I'm bored already. You know, so, uh, whereas I think nowadays, especially people that are food focused, you know, most people know that I think they understand the industry a lot more. Yeah. So place but back then it was like you know what you use mashed potato for ice cream you know or stuff like that. Do you use mashed potato and you know stuff like that so. yeah well, I suppose I guess uh the show that you were a uh, part of as well as one of the judges um yeah. uh, you know really opened a lot of people's eyes as to you know how a book is actually created yeah. I remember a lot of people who uh, they reached out to me afterwards and they were like, oh, so that's what you do when you do a book. And I was like, yeah, yeah man, it's a whole thing. I'm like the least important yeah. person there. There's like the stylist, the prop stylist, the photographers, yeah. the editors, stylists, all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah no, I, I guess that shed even more light on, right? Yeah, I think it's really good as well, because obviously, you know, cookbooks in terms of published, uh, you know, the pub publishing publishing industry they're expensive you know to purchase a cookbook on the whole mm. unless you get a deal or whatever you know at full price a cookbook's more expensive than a, you know fiction or you know any sort of literature and it's because there's so much involved right the author like you say I mean of course you're the most important bit but you know you're only one part of a team you know you've got the photographers the designers the stylists you know and it's such a collaboration and it's mm. so fun as well like we were saying before it can be quite isolating in our industry you don't get to sort of collaborate especially writing a book you know you're often at home on your own or in the kitchen yeah. on your own so when you get to the, the making of the book stage it's so nice because you're there as a team and the team hopefully believe in you and want to create something beautiful so it's so nice and I know you had amazing David with you yeah. as well and, you, know, yeah, you get great yeah. people like that it's really inspiring but yeah I, I think the show sort of helps as well and I just think we're all a bit more you know people like seeing whatever it is people like seeing behind the scenes of things I think now I yeah. think in back in the day especially with food styling it was very much um so, so basically when I left uni I went back to Delicious for a year and I worked at Delicious and Sainsbury's magazine they were all one publishing house at the time and I was there for a year and it was that when I was on a shoot for Sainsbury's that I met Jamie Oliver's head food stylist and she's still with him she's amazing um, and they poached me. So I ended up working with Jamie for 12 years and doing all his telly or his books and all that stuff, which was amazing. But, you know, it, it changed so much by the time I left than even now. And I think because of social media, we like to sort of flip the camera around. We like to see how things are made. You know, back then there was such a, and Jamie was not like this at all, but generally the idea of perfection mm. in photography and, and you know, I mean, ads on telly are still quite mental. They're probably, they were probably my least favorite thing to do just because of the, it's just, it's quite mad. Yeah. Like what goes into, you know, the supermarket Christmas ads, I won't name supermarkets, but you know, <laughs> those 15 second ads that we all love and, you know, drool over at Christmas, they take about a week, if not longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <to> film, <laughs> it's mental. Yeah. You know, I remember once going, and your food styling kit for those situations is like a doctor's kit. Yeah. It was a range of tweezers, razor blades, syringes. Yeah. I remember going straight from a shoot once to Heathrow to catch a flight. I think I was going to Vietnam. And I remember stopping in Hong Kong. Anyway, I kept my food styling kit in my bag. I'd just forgotten. I'd forgotten to take it out. 
And Pete was like, you can't go through with that. Like there is, there is like so many sharp objects in that thing, but it's worth <laughs> hundreds of quid, right? I was like, and I was young. I was like, I can't afford to ditch it. I'm going to have to risk it. Yeah. And I remember going, getting to Hong Kong and the guy just staring at me. <laughs> And he's like, so, sorry, what is this? And I, and this is really naughty. I'm so sorry in advance. But I was like, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm, I'm a doctor. I, I, don't so know, I don't know what to tell you. I love that. That's and he just brilliant. looked at me and was like, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, you know what? You, ha- you had to do what you had to do in that situation. But Nobody got harmed. Shop. I can't, man. That cost me such a lot of money. And I was such a, I was a kid. And I was like, I can't afford to throw all these tweezers and stuff away. I think I did have to ditch the razor blades, but that's fine. But, that's you know. brilliant. I love that story. That's awesome. <laughs> and so, so, so you work for, for Jamie for, you must have learned so much um, oh, yeah. at, the, at that HQ and working with all those like incredibly creative people yeah. and, and, and J.O. himself. And, and then, then did you make a conscious decision to go out on your own and, and do your first sort of books and, and, and create your own brand? And Yeah, I, um, I left Jamie's, I'd already written my first book and I knew I had a two book deal. So I knew I was writing the second one. And it coincided with me having my eldest daughter. And I was just like, and he knew, like, and I'd been honest with him. I was like, you know, once Persephone comes along and whatever. And he was, so, he's always been so supportive and he still is. He's such a great mentor. Um, so I was like, I need to go on my own now. You know, I've got the security blanket of having one book under my belt. Mm. I know I've got another one to write. It was still very scare, scary. You know, the idea of being freelance, I was petrified, but, you know, I did it. And like I said, he's always been really supportive. And, and also what an education, you know, like working with him for 12 years and then meeting people like Antonio Carluccio and Gennaro and working with such an amazing range of people like Anna Jones was, um, we were there at the same time. So when we filmed in LA, like Anna and I had a flat together, you nice. know, met so many cool people and had such a nice time. But I think it was the right time to go solo and sort of work. Yeah, just build up my own stuff, really. I don't think I've ever, I don't think, especially back then, I don't think I was particularly like maybe as savvy, <laughs> you know, like I'm not, I'm always sort of just treading water a bit. But my dream has always just been to write books. So yeah. um, like even the telly stuff, I I didn't do telly for ages because I was like, I don't want to do it. I, I don't, I wasn't particularly very confident, I think. I just thought, everyone would say to me, you're very chatty, you'd be good on TV. And I was like, no, I don't. I'm not, a, look at me, I'm not TV worthy. And I- Oh, don't be silly. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, especially in your twenties as a, as a woman. And, and you know, I didn't see anyone like me. I was like, no, 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 no. The only women on telly were like Delia and Nigella. And I was like, well, I'm gotcha. clearly neither of those. Mm, mm. And I think it's, you know, it really helps to, to have people to look to. So I didn't do telly until Taverna came out and I did a bit of Saturday morning telly, like Saturday Kitchen and Sunday Brunch. Mm. And I was like, actually, I really enjoy it. Like. It's just really nice. And I think having a range of voices yeah. is just really important, isn't it? Like whether yeah. that's from a, um, a sex point of view or ethnicity point of view or, or a class, whatever it is, I think it's just really good to have a range. And I just, I feel really passionate about that. And I really enjoy telly. I actually really like live telly. Do you agree? Yeah, I know. It's so weird. I was going to say that actually, like uh, people always, they, they message me after they see me like doing ITV or whatever. And they're like, how do you do that? Like, how, aren't you nervous? Do you not get like scared? I'm yeah. like, actually, no, I really enjoy it. It's, yeah. I, I love the thrill of like having those seven minutes and then someone yeah. in your ear saying you're halfway through. And then like, oh, my goodness. you know, you get thrown a random question by the presenters. And you're like, yeah. it's all right, I've got this, you know, and yeah. you've got your pans going you're, and you're, it, it's kind of a bit like, you know, rubbing your tummy and patting your head at the same yeah. time when you're, when you're cooking live telly. But yeah. when, once you get used to it, it yeah. becomes really enjoyable. And, and I see that in, in you, because I was fortunate enough to have my first, set the kitchen appearance with yeah. you yeah. and you I, I you must have done it a, a bunch of times because you times. were like yeah. I looked at you I was like okay yeah she, she's got this I, I've got to get to that level <laughs> do you know what I, it's, I think I've done it a couple of times and it it's no it is no I think Saturday kitchen it, it, I probably get out of all of them it's mm. probably the one that I get most nervous from because it's it's also you're on for the whole show so, yeah. you, you know, you can't have a resting bee face. You can't yeah, yeah. be like, you know, you've got to be switched on. And um, whereas, you know, like the other ones, like say you get seven minutes, but it's, it is, it's fun. And, you know, you, you, you see that clearly, like you're so good. 
but is there something like in terms of pre-record stuff like doing the show with Jamie was amazing but very different you know 18 hour mm. days lots of doing the same thing again whereas live telly like I just think especially if you work in a kitchen yeah. it sort of appeals to the nature of those people because we often tend to be people that maybe like doing things ad hoc and not being so scripted yeah so it's really, it's really fun I do like it and just stuff like this is good, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I, th I think like uh, having a range. And I think yeah. one of the great things about being a creator, a cookbook author is you get the chance to dip your toe in a whole bunch of different arenas, whether that's yeah. live TV, pre-record, podcast, yeah. long-form conversation, all that kind of stuff, yeah. which I love because yeah. I, I'm sort of that person that needs like constant um, inspiration from various yeah. sources and like, you know, just, just variety, basically. Yeah, um, But I, I wanted to talk a bit more about Nistissima because yeah. you've got some beautiful photography uh, and, and actual like uh, scenes from yeah. the, the places that have like been your inspiration for the food. And I remember you saying something about how you had, it was at your launch event, how you had like <laughs> all these like priests and stuff on like a WhatsApp. What's that? Yeah. What, so t t tell me a bit about that. that. That's awesome. Oh, honestly, because I wrote it. I got the book deal before the pandemic right. and I, and I, and I was pregnant. <laughs> and then the pandemic hit and I was like, well, <laughs> this is going to be interesting to write this book. And, you know, so just the, Nistissima, basically before Nistissima, I wrote Taverna. Now Taverna is all about my grandparents' restaurant. It's about Greek Cypriot food. It was a real, it was really autobiographical. It was very easy to write and we got to go to Cyprus and it was lovely. But when I was, um, just to give Nistissima backstory, but when mm. I was doing all the publicity around Taverna, because of the way society is now wanting to eat more plant-based stuff, the question I kept getting was, are there vegetarian and vegan recipes in the book? And actually there's loads in Taverna. And it often then led to this spiel that I would give saying, well, actually a lot of people don't know that Greek and Cypriot food is very vegan because of religion. And I kept saying this and I just turned to my publisher. I was like, listen, it's getting ludicrous now. Like people keep asking me, I feel like I need to write this. So she was like, do it. So I was like, yeah, I will. And, um, <laughs> and the timing was terrible. And, uh, and, I, and I got a grant from the Guild of Food Writers. I got generously given this grant to go and travel. Yes, and anyway, yeah. obviously I couldn't. <laughs> and so I was like, so how am I gonna write this during a pandemic pregnant with a toddler? And I just had to, um, well, I worked my ass off and I just had to reach out wherever I could. Um, so I made lots, any connections. I did shouts outs on social media. I asked friends, I asked relatives. And through all these connections, I found various people. So um, a friend of my sisters, they're very religious and they even visit a very beautiful monastery in Lebanon. They gave me the details of this monk, this priest there who um, has kindly been conversing with me on WhatsApp. So Father Augustine, shout out, what a legend. And <laughs> I've got a recipe inspired by him in the book. And then, so the epicenter of sort of Orthodox faith is a place called Mount Athos. Mm -hmm. you should totally go because women aren't allowed right really it, yeah it drives me mental but oh it's my quite, word. you know honestly in part of your at some point in your life in part of your research or studies you should go it's, it's called Mount Athos and there are hundreds of monks and priests that live there and they're completely self-sufficient pr pretty much and you can only access it by boat and it's <sighs> really incredible like it's really if you google it like it's quite remarkable and Anyway, they obviously, this is their diet. And there's a lot to be said about the diet of the Mount Athos monks. Um, so I was, e I basically just emailed all of the, all of the churches there. I was like, guys, right, I'm Greek. This is what I'm writing about. Who's going to help me? Um, and then so I was conversing with a couple of the monks there in Greek. And then I think I said this to you, at the, I said this at the book launch, but it was really funny. There was this one priest, this one monk I was trying to chat to. And uh, and I, at the time, I had a very tiny newborn baby and this toddler and, you know, my time was all over the place and I was trying to pin him down. And I was like, right, can you do this days, these times, because I know I've got help. Any of these work for you. My, this is like Tuesday, nine o'clock, Thursday, 10 o'clock. He was like, by the grace of God, we will speak. <laughs> I was like, babes, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you there. However... <laughs> This is my eye calendar. 
<laughs> we, ne- we never spoke on the phone, put it that way. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it was amazing. And then, and then, you know, through social media, I met some really amazing, um, mostly women actually, like sharing their grandmother's stories with me and whatnot. Uh-huh. And initially it started with Greece and Cyprus, but I didn't want it just to be Greek Cypriot because the Orthodox faith goes far and wide. So we, we went to the Mid- you know, Middle East and then sort of Eastern Europe. So topically Russia, Ukraine. Mm. and then you know Serbia and any other countries that connected and yeah it was amazing so I just had to do what I did as as creatively as I could and it was right at the end the book was about to go to print and they just lifted restrictions Ah. and literally I think we were two weeks on print day and I said guys look I have to use some of this money so all the photos in the book that are in church are an orthodox church in London so we have an amazing church locally, a very beautiful Father John, who whenever I put him on Instagram, I don't mean to be crude, but a lot of people go quite gaga for him. <laughs> and, um, and then we managed to get to Cyprus right at the last minute. And I said, please, uh, please just hold print for a couple of weeks. And I went to this amazing convent, um, which is famous for being self-sufficient and spoke to these nuns. And so the last recipe in the book, it very sort of appropriately, because it was the last thing that we shot and the last thing that I wrote was inspired by the nuns and it's very simple it's just how to make your own cordial you know it's yeah something that's just very every day but really simple so the, yeah. there is this picture that i'm trying to find that's Literally. in this like monish it looks like oh, it'll a, be in the front i think it'll be sort of def- the introduction gotcha the yeah yeah i remember coming across it i was like it just looks so beautiful it was yeah there you go there's like these images yeah. here if you're if you're watching on youtube you, you'll be able to see it but yeah. it's um it's it's wonderful and i i think definitely for the for the next book or books that you do uh more yeah. of those sort of images would be wonderful I and i also noticed on the um on the inside you've got all the different countries that yeah and i was yeah i was surprised to see like slovakia serbia yeah. uh, russia ukraine here like so this sort yeah. of influence of the is it coptic christian well, orthodox. Is that the orthodox orthodox yeah. christian the, the this sort of practice of 50 days before Christmas or 50 days before yeah. uh, Easter. I, I'm assuming this is sort of across all those regions. So yeah. all the different food inspirations is not just yeah. Greek Cypriot or, or it, it's, it's a whole bunch of different cultures that you Absolutely. include in this. Yeah, and it was really important to me to cl- include all of those because whilst obviously Greek, you know, Greek food is my centre, it's actually these are, and the thing is when I first started looking, like I got messages from, uh, I got messages from a woman in Kerala who was like wow. we're orthodox over here and I was like listen it is killing me because I would love <laughs> love maybe that's book four or five yeah. I would love your orthodox Carolyn recipes how incredible would they be amazing but, um I felt like I had to streamline it somewhat in terms of geography mm. and it's sort of that those countries felt natural because they're all neighboring countries and you know and also as is the way with food there's a real there's a real journey so things like moussaka Whilst, you know, we over here, I think people associate moussaka as a Greek recipe. We, you can picture it. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, all over the Middle East and even Eastern Europe, they have different versions of moussaka. Right. So it's been more in, in the Middle East. And then even if you go to like Serbia, and Spain, they have their own versions. So it's it's really, it's interesting. All stuffed vine leaves, you know. Yeah. Turkey, dolma, Greece, dolmabas. We call them gobebia. And in every country, it'll be a different protein or it'll be a different spice blend. And it's just that sort of the you know and i i never get into arguments about these things because how can you pinpoint mm. i mean there will be some things of course you can but i think recipes like that as with our sort of as with people they travel you know and it's just so interesting seeing the transition the change of how these recipes you know change over the over the countries and the influences so um like i love the fact that in eastern europe a lot of the the what we call Gulbebia, the vine leaves will be like fermented cabbage leaves or yeah especially in places like ukraine and olia hercules writes about this you know the bleak winters they have to make do with what they can and they use the fermented cabbage leaves or whatever so it's just really interesting and so it was important to me to sort of look at all those countries really yeah um, and get the stories from different people i think that's the other thing that's really important if you're writing about other people's food especially I think now what we're sort of seeing in the food world is it's really important to do your research to speak to people themselves not just to go on google or yeah you have to really do your due diligence and I think that's really important so I was gutted I couldn't travel more than I did 
but it did make researching the book really funny absolutely absolutely and i think you know it kind of speaks to that point in our in our timeline that you had to you know start yeah, with yeah. Group with different people and I think just to that point actually about um cultural heritage and and f- as recipe writers mm-hmm. I know for me uh, in particular I write recipes from a from a mixture of different cultures one of the sort of challenges that I I love to to sort of entertain it and, and, and rise to is making healthy food applicable to the very diverse population of London, yeah. right? So I'll have Korean people come into my, my clinic, Sri Lankan, yeah. uh, different parts of Africa, you know, just, just everywhere. And like, they tell me their recipes yeah. and I rewrite it back to them yeah. with like healthier twists, Love turning that. up this, turning down that, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But I think this whole concept of ensuring that we are being respectful yeah. of uh, people's cultural heritage particularly in in books is is it's very topical but it's yeah. super super important Thank how you. do you for, for any people who are writing recipes out there how how do you feel this is um uh, a, a subject to sort of to to tackle like what, what what are the sort of key things that people should should really be looking at you you mentioned one yeah. of them which is obviously go go to the source as much as possible yeah and, you know that, I think that's the thing you know it's a hard one I've been I've been asked this when the tv show came out there was um one publication that asked me you know can English or, or Caucasian people write about other countries you know other communities and other other foods ethnicities foods and I and, and yes they can of course they can. And equally, someone from, you know, an Indian food writer can write about Italian food. That's not to say you only can write about the food of your country, because also it, it, it's not that, I mean, that that's boring, right? Like people travel, like we say, it's interesting, it's ideas, and that's mm. the beauty of food. But I think there are some writers who just do it so well. Like if you're going to write about, you know, if you're going to really write about another country or another culture, you have to submerge yourself in that culture as much as you can. And you have to be authentic. So, and I don't just mean, I mean, travel, of course, but also talking to people, you know, being educated on stuff like that. And I think that's really important, eating a wide range of foods, not just writing. I don't, I don't, I mean, of course this happens, but not just writing a recipe because you've seen it somewhere and you're going to copy it. Mm. As a, as a book writer, I think that's really important. I think when you're a magazine writer and you're given a brief and they're two very different things so people that write about books you have such a responsibility on your hands I think to do a good job and to tell the story well because there will if you have the privilege of writing a book there are always people behind you that don't have that privilege who might have a better voice or a more educated voice so if you have that privilege you have to do a good job of it I think the difference is things like magazines because when you work on a magazine or you're a magazine recipe writer you are asked to write a really wide range so mm. I appreciate that you can't always travel or whatever but you just have to be really educated and I think the good thing with social media is we can now interact and follow people cooking and talk about different cultures and stuff and I think just if you are doing that just you know don't be don't be stupid yeah <laughs> yeah it takes I, I know it sounds really basic but just don't don't be stupid if you are going to go there like do your do your homework really yeah. Yeah. you know and I think it's yeah, I think it's as basic as that. And if you're going to go to the extent of writing a book about it, then by all means, you need to be paying your dues. But like I say, that is any, any, I do firmly believe that anyone can write about anything. And I think that mm. swings both ways because I think there's backlashes from both ways. But I think we can all write about what we want, but you just have to make sure you do the research. Because I, you know, I want to write about Italian food or Indian food or, you know southeast asian food like i love those kind of foods like my weakness is indian food like if i was never able to write about that again it would kill me because i whilst my books my last two books are sort of greek and middle and mediterranean i've been trained to cook from all these sorts of cuisine so you know but i just think it's about being respectful yeah i i can so see your next book being going to kerala honestly oh like <laughs> I would love that. Oh, I would absolutely love to read when that. When that lovely lady reached out, I, I it's like someone stabbed me. I, <laughs> I knew I couldn't, you know, like it would be too random. Because that point we'd figured out that we were sort of specialising on Eastern Med and, and Middle East. Yeah. And I was like, but come on. <laughs> I, but the thing is, of course, I don't, 
you know, it, it would be amazing cuisine. But at the same time, you, as you know, you know, like Indian, especially in the South, like there's not the masses of meat any, you know, like it's sort of, yeah. it would be hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About all that fabulous food, really. Wasn't yeah. It, you know, like, yeah. And I, t- I mean, like, I think it's something like 30% of the population, which is like, a billion people are vegetarian uh, or yeah. vegan so you know the wealth of variety that you have across the entire country yeah. is just amazing um i i wanted to do maybe maybe not a book but like um a, a series on youtube or something yes. where i literally go from the top of the country punjab which is basically where my my heritage is from yep. and just traveling all the way down meeting various sort of food writers and researchers along the way and then just sort of speaking to scientists uh, from both the conventional and the ayurvedic tradition of medicine because in in india i'm not sure if you're aware but like uh, the conventional and uh, complementary medicine sort of sit side by side and they're both both government state funded as well yeah which is amazing yeah it's incredible which is this beautiful like amalgamation of of both sort of sides with with equal respect and i think that's something we, we we sort of I think we're coming around to it here, but we're, slow, we're definitely, yeah, we're, we're definitely slow for yeah. that sort of appreciation on, on both sides. So I'd love to do a series like where oh. we do that. And then we also like cook the food as well. And, Luke, you know, you we, have we give, to do it. I would love that, to do that. Yeah. That would be so amazing. <laughs> and if I could just come to Kevin and, and chat to this woman and chat to you at the end of that episode, that'd be amazing. I'll be there. <laughs> but that, like that is, I would so watch that. That to me, and I don't think I'm being biased because I, I love the, you know the food and the culture in the country but that would be fascinating like how cool would that be it'd be such yeah. a good thing to watch and also you're so right about medicine I, I you know I'm lucky enough I've been to India a few times and I do find that fascinating fascination you know like the way they do combine both you know the medicine mm. I think over here we're so we're so like western medicine and that's all anyway mm. I mean that's another whole big conversation but I totally agree like I'm having issues with my littlest one at the moment with her eczema Mm. and all the every specialist i've seen every doctor just wants to put her on steroids i'm like she's a baby mm. you know and it's like actually come on guys let's think about this let's what do we know about gut and things and, and and okay you know anyway boring but that's my point like there's always more to it and i think people other cultures are so much better at questioning seeing the bigger picture than sometimes we are i think we just want yeah. to put a plaster on it yeah, I'm yeah like, yes yeah. that steroid cream will help her but but there must be a reason, you know, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. No, that's, it's, it's definitely not boring. And, and this is certainly <laughs> the audience. And I, I know people okay, are good. dying out for sort of, uh, uh, I'm not asking topic. for medical advice. I'm not asking. For no, medical no, no, of course not. It's like as a parent as well, I'm like, come on, like she's, her wrists and stuff are bleeding. Like I, mm. I, I know the steroid cream works because I've been in a position where I've had to use it, but there is more to this. I know this, it's yeah. my, it's my job. Like I know there'll be things that'll be triggering her. Yeah. It's, so black and white it's like they do the tests and they're like well she's not allergic to peanut and I'm like yeah that's great but and I've learned just through doing what I do and understanding about my food I've learned that tomatoes trigger her mm. because they're acidic you know like mm. I know but they don't tell you because it's all very black and white isn't it yeah so. yeah yeah it can be and I think there's definitely like that way of um taking uh, a, a holistic approach while still yeah. appreciating that in the in the first instance, yes, okay, we're going to dampen yes. down the inflammation, yeah. use steroids, use systemic stories. Sometimes if we need yes. to, if it's really bad, but we're also going to try and investigate the underlying cause, whether that's yeah. a food trigger, by doing food diaries, looking yeah. at the family history, you know, yeah. the things, things like mode of birth and exposures. Yeah. The exposome is a really, really big topic we're actually going to be talking about on the podcast uh, hopefully soon uh, okay. about air quality in general I'll but also it. other yeah oh, other no. well, I mean it's tough isn't it because like it's oh. a scary topic but no one's really talking about it other yeah. than in the context of like ULEZ which is yeah, yeah. which just pisses people off understandably but at the same time it's like the WHO levels for air pollution are yeah. exceeded three times over in London alone yeah, right I, yeah. no one's really talking about that uh, and we should really yeah. given that we know what these pollutants can be capable of yeah um and it's not just like scary things like cancer it's like yeah. other things like asthma respiratory asthma. conditions and inflammation yeah. in general so yeah it's it, yeah. it's definitely a topic but in, in terms of 
childhood eczema it's a growing issue and um we actually tackled this in a topic with a a colleague of mine who's looking at other ways of um exposing kids Uh, it's more in the context of um uh, allergens Uh, okay yeah exposing my putting in micro exposures and then like increasing it uh, over time but they were doing that on the street weren't they because my husband's allergic to peanuts and stuff and they were saying that with kids they're giving them very tiny dosages you know, it's not, I don't think it's a coincidence that we went to, we were traveling around the Greek islands in the summer and her eczema went. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You yeah. know, like I just, I don't think that's, anyway, so you're completely right. I don't think yeah. that's, you know, just a coincidence. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 We, really... we can, ch- we can definitely chat about that um, oh, yeah. as well. And yeah, no, no, for sure. For sure. And I, I, I like uh, people that yeah. uh, they, on my newsletter, uh, people request podcast topics all the time and we have like this massive long list of things that we need to approach like we've done quite a bit on uh, menopause at the moment but we have things like osteoporosis we have dementia uh eczema is definitely up there childhood eczema and we've done adult eczema and we've actually done a a really good podcast with dr ruth kamish okay who um who talked about uh steroid overuse syndrome yeah Um, she's really really good and someone i I always recommend people to actually because she's a, a patient herself and I think okay. that makes the, the best doctor. Yeah, because you understand it and coming from, I'll have to listen to that one. It is, yeah. it's just really interesting. But I think, you know, we, it's good that we are starting to have these conversations. And, but I think, yeah, we need to, you know, especially like you say, generationally, like people like my parents or my in-laws, you know, they go to the doctor and it's very, it's verbatim. Like what they say, like that's, it's what you do. Like they wouldn't yeah. think outside. I remember when my other granny, bless her, God rest her soul, she, um, I was in my 20s and she suffered terribly of arthritis, bless her, but she was very stoic and she would mm. never moan, ever, ever, ever. And there wasn't much that could be done in terms of her pain and just to sort of help her. Um, and she would just hobble around and she would never moan. And I'd said to her a few times, go to an acupuncturist. I've got this lovely guy. Let me take you. Let me take you. Anyway, one day she never complained. She just turned to me and said, I think I'd like to try. She was obviously so desperate. And, you know, mm. this is a, an 80 year old Greek Cypriot immigrant that is quite out there for her, you know, acupuncture. And she went and she did the six sessions and, and, and genuinely a few years later, she said, I think we need to go back. And that to me said everything. It helped yeah. her in a way that nothing the GP had given her had helped her. Yeah. And, and that, that says everything, you know, and I just think it's so, it's so interesting and actually the only reason even my family were doing acupuncture was because we were lucky enough to have this brilliant Indian doctor growing up and my mum he used to do acupuncture my mum the GP really yeah. that's so good yeah I was like eight or nine and I remember being in the GP's wait in the room with my mum and him putting needles in her Wow. You know, and that's in like the late eighties, probably early nineties, and I just think, wait, what? A, you know, at the time I was like, cool. But now I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? What a legend. <laughs> yeah. Like that's brilliant great. that he did that, you know. And so yeah, it's 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 just it's just changing, I think, people's attitudes and perceptions. You know, you you'll, you'll you'll have the right audience because they're interested because and that's why they listen. Mm. But it's the people that aren't, you know, the ones that like my mother-in-law who were desperately trying to get high acupuncture and yeah you know come on it yeah. can help you know for sure yeah it's, and you can find it, it's a bit of a postcode lottery at the moment because you can find acupuncture in some nhs surgeries that are covered really? by the nhs um but someone someone who's really spearheaded this uh is dr michael dixon he's got a surgery down in devon okay. um but he's really influential he, he he's got sort of connections with with the royals and stuff and obviously prince yeah. charles is quite into a lot of this yeah. stuff yeah um but uh he managed to get yoga i think on the nhs and a, and a whole bunch of other sort of complementary um uh treatments so no yeah. it's, it's it's great it's definitely happening but it, you're right it's it's sort of slow um yeah. listen w- we've been chatting for a while Sorry. i could chat to you for so much longer <laughs> I honestly i i love it i love your enthusiasm <laughs> for food Aww. um this is sort of a uh, slightly out of the norm for the for the pod but yeah. equally as yeah. important i think because you. you know otherwise we'd just be talking about like research and nutrition but yeah. your book really puts a lot of what we talk about into practice with you know oh. the incredible mixture of diversity of food yeah. i've got this thing um uh the uh uh sweet and sour leeks that's on oh, my yes. list uh, yeah oh, yeah and there's you. a batata uh, oh, har- yes. hara chili dressed potatoes 
these these are definitely on my There's, on my list do you know what it's so easy <laughs> they're so easy and that's the thing with that book like they're just recipes that are vegan i'm not trying yeah. to make them vegan yeah i'm not using like and there's that's cool there's a time and a place and there are some fantastic chefs and bloggers doing that but these are just celebrating recipes that are vegan and i think yeah you know it was it's so cool you know you having me on here has been such you know such a privilege and such an honor because obviously you are it is more medical stuff but I think in terms of diet and health, it, it has been really interesting to write and relevant, I think. Definitely. No, no. And I, I love that. It's, you know, vegan and plant-based dishes that are have always been vegan and yeah, plant-based. You're not like are. converting it. It's no. not like, you know, there's a big uh, yeah. meat skewer that yeah, you yeah, yeah. like you <laughs> tempeh yeah. or something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Honestly, you, it's been such a pleasure, Georgie. Oh, what a wonderful. It was awesome. If you enjoyed that video, you will love the library of content that we have on thedoctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.